Fantastic. So <clears throat> here we are. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And a particularly warm welcome to Sean, Sean Chamberlain. We're really excited for this, uh, for this conversation. Um, I've, been, I've been listening to you and kind of watching from afar for several years, Sean, and, uh, um, and more recently got to know you a bit better through your, your uh, couple of the courses that I'm doing with Sterling College. Uh, including uh, Surviving the Future, A Deeper Dive, um, which I'm really thoroughly uh, enjoying. So welcome, Sean. Thanks, Kim. It's a real pleasure to be here and get to know your, your little gang. Fantastic. So perhaps we could start, you run a, a, a your website is called um, Dark Optimism. Um, and I know that that's a, <clears throat> a phrase that's often misunderstood by people when they first hear it. I'm just putting the website address in the chat now. Um, so Sean, could you, could you tell us a bit about what you mean by dark optimism? Sure. Yeah, I, I suppose it, it kind of stems from uh, being a bit fed up of, of kind of bright, shiny optimism, you know, like the whole, ah, everything's fine, don't worry about it kind of optimism. And you're like, well, it's not though, is it? <laughs> you know, and it kind of uh, always, you know, stuck in the core a bit. But at the same time, um, you know, I sometimes say it's it's about being unashamedly realistic about the kind of world we're in, but unashamedly positive about the kind of world we could be creating. Um, and I think, yeah, it's about kind of realizing that no matter how much darkness there is in the world around us and and there's plenty um there's nothing about these times that stops us from telling a story we're proud to tell with our days um and ultimately that's all anyone's ever been able to ask from life you know i mean even even going to a famous book by victor frankl about living in a concentration camp and even finding meaning and purpose in days there i mean you know on the one hand uh, my friend Nate Hagen sometimes talks about walking the narrow path between kind of despair and doom and kind of wild, often kind of green techno optimism. Um, and uh, and I just think, well, if someone in a concentration camp can find meaning and purpose in their days, then I, honestly, I don't feel I have it much right to fall into just despair and bleakness. You know, it, it's just inappropriate to the kind of situation we find ourselves in mm. on the other hand you know the kind of optimism that's like everything's going to be fine so we don't need to do anything about it or or tell any 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 beautiful tales with our with our lives seems to me to miss the point as well so i guess dark optimism is about that um yeah that point of acknowledging the reality of things which i think it's fair to say is is, is quite dark at this moment in history um but doing it with a kind of undaunted determination to make things better than they would otherwise be. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. And I know that you're one of the things you're most proud of in your life is continuing the work of collaborating with the late, great David Fleming um, and the wonderful book that you created after his death, I think, um, or published after his death, uh, Lean Logic, which I've certainly found a, a fantastic treasure trove of a resource. Um, can you say a bit about uh, about that and, and um, that kind of legacy and, and just a short introduction maybe to David Fleming for those that don't know him? Mm. Sure. So David was um, well. Firstly, he was he was an incredible friend and mentor to me. Um, I met him back at the end of two thousand six when he taught me at Schumacher College down in in Devon in England here, and. Um, he was uh, one of the, not founders of the Green Party in this country or the Ecology Party as it originally was, um, or even the People Party before that, but he, he and Jonathan Porritt together were kind of very close friends who kind of took the, the Green Party and brought it into some kind of national relevance in, in England and Wales. Um, and by training, he was a historian um but what he found was with his kind of background in cultural history and his great interest in in the ecological issues very broadly um 
the, what kept happening was he'd speak to people and they'd say, oh, well, the economists say that's not realistic. You know, we can't realistically, you know, transform the direction of the economy. Um, and uh, Jonathan Porritt told, tells me that back at the very early Ecology Party conferences, David was there kind of urging people to learn the language of economics so that we could meet these arguments on their own ground and, and, and prove them wrong. Uh, and true to his word, he went and got himself a PhD in economics. Um, and, uh, and I think it's quite unusual that someone kind of steps into a discipline in that way without sort of absorbing some of the, the kind of primary assumptions of that discipline. But for him, it was very much he was going in to kind of challenge some of the, the fundamental premises. He, he, he sometimes said to me, it's, uh, economics is like this, this great inverted pyramid. Um, that there's just this incredible edifice of brilliant mathematics and modeling and insight. Um, and it wouldn't be so dangerous if it weren't so brilliant. The problem is that it's teetering on this tiny point of these completely insane assumptions. Um, and so you've got this, this whole brilliant ed edifice built on the wrong assumptions. Um, and so it can look really daunting and impressive when you encounter it and when you see all the graphs and the, you know, all these very highly respected economists coming out and explaining how there's nothing to worry about because we'll just you know invent our way out of any limits to growth etc um but yeah so david um through this kind of bringing together of, of history and economics um was involved in he was a, a chair of the soil association um he helped create a thing called the other economic summit that was a kind of challenge to i think it was the g7 at the time um uh, which then led to the New Economics Foundation, which now does a lot of great work. Um, and he was one of the great inspirations behind the Transition Towns movement. Um, my, my friend Rob Hopkins, who was the kind of founder of, of Transition Towns, often says that, very humbly I might add, he often says that uh, all he did was take um, Richard Heinberg on kind of energy depletion, David Holmgren on permaculture, and David Fleming on community and resilience, roll the three together and make it comprehensible and you know transition fell out um which i think underplays rob's own role somewhat but nonetheless uh is gives a sense of where david's coming from and i think um i mean as you mentioned uh so he he died in 2010 very suddenly um without getting his his kind of life's work this book um lean logic a dictionary for the future and how to survive it published um and it was only after his death that I uh, found the manuscript basically and, and read it um, and was just blown away by this work that's, I mean, it's very unusual in many ways. It's sort of structured a bit like Wikipedia. Um, so, you know, each entry, wherever there's a word that has its own entry, there'll be a star next to it. So you can kind of um, choose your own pathway through the book, depending on your, your personal interest. Um, and when I first talked to publishers about it, they were like, wow, this is incredible, but it's in this strange format and it's really big. Um, and so I, I edited out from that this paperback, Surviving the Future, which basically um, chooses one of the pathways through that dictionary and turns it into a conventional read it front to back paperback. Um, the subtitle, so it's, it's Surviving the Future, Culture, Carnival and Capital in the Aftermath of the Market Economy. Um, and that's, I think, what's so I mean there's a lot I could say about this book really and that's why I'm teaching an eight-week course based around it but um I think the essence of it would be two things like firstly even back in the 80s David you know he'd been campaigning working within kind of politics with his Green Party work um but even back in the 80s he was like mm, uh, we're not going to win this argument um, you know, there isn't going to be a great cultural turning to sanity. There should be. <laughs> There's all kinds of excellent arguments as to why we should go that way. But, you know, you read all these books about, you know, Plan B 3.0 and whatever that are all like, hey, hey, everyone, we really, 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 really need to change direction now. And they all, for me at least, are a bit hollow because you read them and you're like, well, yeah, I agree. But how do we turn the super tanker, you know? Yeah. Um, and as I say, even even sort of 40 years ago, David was like, well, actually, we're not going to. There's too much cultural momentum. There's too much economic momentum. There's too much political momentum tied up in the story, essentially, of, of, of economic growth and everything that comes up with that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so really his starting point was where most other books end. His starting point was, 
okay, if we don't change direction, where are we going to end up? Um, and so his starting point really was collapse. Um, and then that led to kind of two themes, which are firstly, what does it make sense to do now in advance of that in the places that aren't yet facing collapse? And secondly, what might life look like after it? Because it's, it's you know, the end of the world as we know it is not the end of the world. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so to massively boil down like a, a huge work, I would say the two things that he advocates um, focusing on are defending and restoring the natural world, the ecology, because that's what all wealth is ultimately based in. Um, and defending and restoring what he calls the informal economy, like ways of relating to each other that are not based in money, um, community and culture and conviviality and fun and family and love. Like this is what life's really about music, the arts, you know, this is, this is really, you know, all, all economics should be just the kind of backdrop where we, you know, provide ourselves with a nice safe place to live and food and water. And then we get on with actually having a culture. Um, but unfortunately, as, as he said in one interview, the, the needle hiss has kind of taken over now. You know, it should just be the kind of backdrop there, but it's now all that we ever talk about because our economics has gone so so wildly wrong. Yes, I was interested to read in the February uh, February this year IPCC report. It's the first time I've seen it in one of those reports, but again, as you said, it sounded fairly hollow, but they said, here's the quote, a climate resilient, sustainable world involves fundamental changes to how society functions, including changes to underlying values, worldviews, ideologies, social structures, political and economic systems and power relationships. Um, I don't suppose anybody will take any notice of that, but that was the, it was interesting. It was the first time I'd heard them kind of come out and say that. Well, no, back in 2018, um, the IPCC called for, quote, rapid and far reaching unprecedented transformation in the economy um so you know they don't they don't really want to be saying that you know they're they're i mean i was talking to a climate scientist one time who said you know when i got into this field it was this obscure corner of chemistry essentially you know it wasn't like <laughs> this huge political football that was gonna you know transform everything he, he was just very interested in atmospheric chemistry um and then you know here they are finding themselves thrust as the central players in this you know global reckoning it's it's a strange lot that climate scientists have today yes so um <clears throat> i've shared this with you before this little um this little slide uh, we call it the four columns um and mm -hmm. i think from what you've said already um i mean our community group is kind of firmly sat in column four what we'd call collapse aware um so i guess that's where i guess that's where you are I guess that's where you are too, mm -hmm. uh, whilst remaining, as you said, unashamedly optimistic about what we could do um, if we got our act together. So, well, um, not only what we could do collectively if we get our act together, but what we can do as as people and as communities. Um, you know, I think one of the key problems in what people advocate is, you know, the two things we're always told to do are like lobby our political representatives and personal lifestyle change. And honestly, they're both really depressing because, you know, you lobby your political representatives and you get ignored and you think, oh, that was great. Um, maybe you transform your life utterly to something incredibly. I mean, my friend Mark, who lives 50 yards behind me here, has given up electricity. He's not just off grid, but he was like, well, nobody's explained to me how you can make a solar power panel without industrial civilization. Nobody's explained to me how you can make industrial civilization without destroying the natural world. So I want no part of it. Um, and I'm all for living simply like it's a beautiful thing and it, it, it is often about living a life that's in accordance with your beliefs but equally it's it's depressing because you know full well the whole world's plowing in the opposite direction and, and and killing everything and you know they used to say in the 60s and 70s you know it's amazing there's this whole machine but you can just drop out and it plows on and doesn't even notice you and and that was to some extent true then but now it's the machine has got so big it's you know destroying stability of our climate there's there's nowhere really to hide anymore but the thing about those two things that are advocated, you know, lobbying political representatives, personal lifestyle change, the problem with both of them, I think, is scale. Like lobbying your political representatives is trying to act at a scale that's too big for your voice to be heard. Personal lifestyle change is operating at a scale that's too small to feel like it's making any meaningful difference. 
And in between those is what we often call the human scale, like the community scale, the scale that I think you guys operate on. Um, you know, it's it's where you get together at a scale where which is small enough that your voice is significant and your actions are significant and you can shape things, but large enough that you can see meaningful consequences, that you can affect the lives of people around you. Um, and I think that's really one of the one of the core focuses of of David's work. And the quote of his that I that's most changed my life um, is uh, large scale problems do not require large scale solutions. They require small scale solutions within large scale frameworks. And that's been transformative for me. And ever since like kind of hearing and integrating that, all of my work has been about those frameworks. So Transition Towns, it's a framework for a whole diversity of local solutions that don't look like each other, but they can support each other and network and build into this kind of wave of change. The courses that I run are, you know, a framework for all kinds of diverse people to explore and learn and, and gain more empowerment in what they do. The Ecological Land Cooperative that I used to chair is a large scale framework to support people in getting onto the land and in a way that's affordable and that gets through the planning system. And that is such a key principle, I think. Um, David used to call it the, the system scale rule. Um, you know, that if you if you try and go straight to the large scale, you'll get lost. And if you stick at the small scale, you'll get drowned out. But there, there's some there's some real power to be had. Yeah, yeah. I just had a, a kind of, I suppose, a semi-technical question before we go on to talk more about feeling fully alive and walking that narrow path. And it's about... It's about renewables because so many people, even in the transition movement, um, I kind of seem to be banking on that. And I, I just wondered what your um, what your take was. You know, when, uh, when, well, the, when, the, when the fundamental problem is overshoot rather than necessarily even emissions. Well, I sometimes say let's imagine that we discovered miraculously some infinite clean energy source. Um, you know, cold fusion suddenly became possible in a teacup due to some incredible work of science or mysticism or, or you know, we suddenly discovered this, I don't know, infinite reserve of clean oil bubbling up somewhere, you know, whatever. Um, imagine what happens if you plug that into our civilization. Like, does it suddenly look like this thing of beautiful justice and sustainability and hope? No, it just grows faster, destroys habitats more quickly, like continues to devour everything in support of human existence. And incidentally, you know, in support of a, a human economy where, I mean, it's a little glib and, and oversimplistic, but I sometimes say, you know, half the world's hungry and half the world's depressed and we're destroying the future in order to sustain this system a little bit longer. Um, so, you know, it's clear that our fundamental problem is not one of energy sources. And it's also clear that the big green NGOs have chosen that narrative. You know, what we need to do is get off fossil fuels and onto renewables. And, you know, then we'll be, I don't even know what they, where they think we'll be, but that's the whole focus. <laughs> um, you know, that'll solve climate change and everything will be perfect. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of holes in that narrative. Um, I mean, not least that, in a growth based economy, um, you know, if you look at the amount of renewable energy that's coming on stream, which is, is a great thing, you know, if we're going to get energy from somewhere, far better to get it from renewables and fossil fuels. But at the moment, that's not actually replacing fossil fuels, no. it's just being no. added to fossil fuels. Um, and so we are consuming more and more and more. And for all the talk, I mean, even just focused on climate change, for all the talk of decoupling emissions from economic growth. Um, I would argue very strongly that the theory says that that's impossible, but in the practice equally clearly says that that's impossible. We're not managing to do that. Um, the, 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 the tight coupling between the growth in economies and the growth in emissions is, is startling when you, when you just you know, plot it on a graph. And so it's very, very clear that if we're going to, well, have, have any kind of decent future um, we need to face up to this this fundamental issue of growth. I mean, essentially, we're in this 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 incredibly hard dilemma. Like, I sometimes also get frustrated with degrowth advocates who paint it as this really wonderful, easy thing where you know we're all just going to have to work a bit less hard and you know consume a bit less, and everything will be wonderful, and we'll move into this degrowth utopia. Um, you know, I think that 
we're in a <laughs> we're in a situation where either we end growth which means the collapse of our economic systems and you know there's no there's no way that's intrinsically desirable um but we either stop growing and collapse our economy or we keep growing and collapse our ecology um that's the very unfortunate bind that we've put ourselves in collectively um and you know david has a, a very insightful entry on on growth in his dictionary for the future and how to survive it um and he says there that it's it's very easy for those of us who've spent our entire lives living through a period of economic growth to not appreciate how much that's brought us um to not appreciate how incredibly difficult it will be to move away from that um time he quotes um I think it's a Roman, ancient Roman source who said, uh, war is sweet to those who know it not. Um, and, you know, moving beyond the period of economic growth is not something we should be intrinsically singing hosannas about, but the alternative is a lot worse. Yes. Um, so th the point is that economic growth will end, you know, like this, we treat sustainability as though it's this kind of bolt on thing. Like first you, I don't know, get a good job and like start a company and, and earn your wage. And do, and then if you've got a bit of spare capacity, you might think about like, oh, how can we integrate sustainability into what we're doing? But what the word means is the ability to continue. So if something is unsustainable and nobody ever claims that our current society is sustainable, but equally nobody ever seems to admit that that means it's going to end, which is literally <laughs> what the word means. <laughs> um, okay. and, so, and so... so are you saying, or I don't want to put words in your mouth, are you saying collapse in one way, collapse, bring it on, even though... Uh, the... uh, to quote John Michael Greer, I'm saying collapse now and avoid the rush. Yeah. Um, you know, collapse is coming in the sense that there's no way we can possibly sustain the, the path that we're on now. Um, you know, put it this way, like, either we radically change direction or we end up where we're headed. And neither of those look like today. So the future is not gonna look like today. Um, and the consequences of what's unfolding today don't bring that to a, you know, a nice crash landing on a big fluffy bed of pillows and duvets. Um, you know, collapse also, I think, is not, not something we should talk about as a, as a future event anymore um no, there's no. um the uh the science fiction writer william gibson said the future's already here it's just unevenly distributed um and you know there have been a lot of people taking part in our surviving the future courses for example from places that they very clearly say have, have collapsed um you know a good friend of mine who i met through the courses is from venezuela and she's you know talks about what it's like living through economic collapse what it's like seeing all your school friends struggling to feed themselves um so you know it's it's um i tend to look at the world less as moving towards this event of collapse and in some ways this is this is um in some ways it's a reassuring thought it's not that we're like standing on the train tracks waiting for the train of collapse to hit us you know collapse is what we're living through now i i more think of it as shrinking circles of affluence so anyone, anyone who's still sitting around going, well, where's your apocalypse, mate? You know, well, they're still inside one of those shrinking circles of affluence. The majority of the world is not inside those shrinking circles of affluence. And I would also add, let's look beyond humanity when we talk yeah. about our world. Um, you know, the majority of the non-human world is experienced human driven collapse and has been for a very long time. You know, all these triumphant techno utopians who talk about um well look at the graph of human population which is the most terrifying graph i've ever seen look at the graph of human population and the the exponential growth as a as a triumph you know this shows the incredible ingenuity of our species and you're like well well hang on can we also when we talk about world population we invariably are talking about world human population and if we actually plot world population and include everybody else who's on the planet that graph doesn't look like that because everybody else is, is going the other way virtually everybody else yeah um so, so thank you so you uh, and you touched on this um briefly already but so given all of that what what nourishes you what allows you to feel fully alive um 
what 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 insights can you share with us about yeah how um how to make a, a story of your life that's worth telling like what have you seen about that for yourself yeah i mean i think to talk about that or one way into talking about that would be the word sacrifice which i find a very interesting word because the etymology of sacrifice is to make sacred and that's really interesting to me because we tend to think of sacrifice as this painful, awful thing, like giving something up, losing something. Um, but for example, like I, I quit flying, well, it'd be 20 years ago this year um, for climate reasons, not because I thought that would derail the you know global emissions and save the world. Um, but it, I mean, it was a very, it was a very personal thing, really, that um, I was seeing a girl at the time from California. And one thing in the world I'd love to see more than anything else is the, the great redwood trees in California. Um, I'm, I'm a little obsessed with trees. And, um, and she invited me out to, to sort of meet her family out there. And, and I just realized I felt really deeply uncomfortable with this, this idea. And and it was particularly difficult talking about this at the time because now people know, oh, Sean doesn't fly. But then I, you know, I've flown plenty before that. <laughs> and then suddenly I'm like, no, I don't want to go to California. But when I reflected on that, I thought, I don't feel right about going to see these great beings and knowing in myself that in so doing, I've contributed to their demise. That that doesn't feel like who I want to be. And so giving up that experience was actually a process of choosing to be happier. Like I didn't want that, that dissonance inside me of knowing that I was acting in ways that were contributing to something I despise. That isn't how I want to be, not because I want to be like a good person or, um, you know, because I think it's going to save the world, but because I like being happy. And, and when I reflected on it, and I think there's a, as I've, as I've kind of reflected on that decision over the, couple of decades since um I've kind of distilled it into this principle I suppose that you know I think there's a reason why so many ecologically aware folk have a have a reputation of being really hectoring and annoying and dull as ditch water and wouldn't know how to enjoy themselves in a vegan chocolate factory um and you know it's because so many of us live in this continual tension between kind of uh guilt and self-sacrifice you know it's like you know oh I really want a bacon sandwich but I shouldn't oh but I really want one so I'm either feeling terrible about not getting the thing I want or terrible about getting the thing I want and god of course that's not inspiring like of course nobody nobody looks at that and thinks oh yeah I want to live like that right but what I what I do instead of that is let the two parts of myself talk to each other which seems to be something so rare in our culture like the part of me that wants the thing the you know the jet flight the bacon sandwich the whatever it is and the part of me that doesn't want the consequences of the thing and I find that when I let those two parts of myself actually talk to each other pretty quickly they come to an accord and as I say I I realized not that oh god part of me wants to fly to California and part of me doesn't but no I as an integrated person don't want to go and so I'm not going to go and that's not you know, painful. That's actually a choice yeah, of me yeah, doing yeah. what I want to do. Yeah. Um, and I think that that process of living wholeheartedly, you know, choosing things with your entire self is such a key to being fully alive. Um, and, and it really is as simple as just taking the different parts of yourself that are in conflict and, you know, letting them, letting them converse and then kind of converge. Um, yeah. That's brilliant. And Diane's just said in the chat, Gollum had the right idea then talking to himself. <laughs> yeah, Gollum's my personal guru, actually. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah, yeah. He lives under my bed now. Don't tell anyone because he's not very popular. But yeah. <laughs> That's brilliant. OK, so we're about halfway through. I'm going to open it up now for uh, other people to ask questions. So we're quite a small group. So just unmute yourself and uh, and come in. Um, I can't see everybody, so just just go for it. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, I've got, I've got a question, Sean. First of all, thanks okay. so much for coming and see, speaking to us today. It's just really inspirational, really enjoying this conversation. Um, what for you 
obviously we're in this kind of shrinking tunnel of affluence now. Um, what for you, how, how do you envision collapse here coming about? Here being Hertfordshire? Yeah, or England, or you know. Yeah, I mean, I'm actually in Ireland at the moment. Um, my, uh, yeah, I'm part of a little little community here around a place called the Happy Pig. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I again, um, I think even within the, well, I, I could probably speak most of the English context because that's where I've been for most of my life. Um, you know, even within that context, again, I think the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. Um, you know, there are there are growing numbers of people who struggle to feed their families and heat their homes. And, um, you know, one of the consequences of a culture that financializes everything, that, 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 that quantifies everything in terms of money, um, is that collapse turns into a financial issue as well. Um, you know, the way that we decide who gets to eat is who's got the, the rationing coupons with the Queen's head on them. Um, you know, who's got the money. And there's nothing inherently monetary about this crisis, but that's just how we decide to share out our, our resources and our, and our decisions about who gets to do what and who, who has to do what. Um, and so at this stage, I think the main thing is that, um, you know, we're seeing at the moment, uh, is it like any, any, any day now, the uh, energy prices are going to shoot up by about 50% for most people due to the way that the, the government um, it sort of manipulates, isn't quite the word I'm looking for, but the way the government um, manages uh, energy prices and energy companies. Um, and, you know, that's going to get harder and harder for more and more people. And I think that's why it seems to me some of the most important work that we can do is offering different stories of what underpins that. Um, because I mentioned uh, my friend um, from Venezuela uh, and she had the quite depressing experience um, in the last few months that she's been back home in Venezuela and talking to a lot of people there. Um, and what she's found is that people have gone through this kind of collapse process and all that they are talking about is how do we get back to where we were? Like, how do we get Nutella in the supermarkets again? Um, because the process has been one of having something involuntarily taken away from them. A bit like if I, you know, um, had had someone come to me and say, well, you just can't fly anymore. You know, we're, we're banning you from flying. Well, then I'd probably just be thinking, well, how do I get my flights back, right? It's very different from having gone through a process of, of coming to a place of realizing that actually I don't want that or the consequences of that. Um, and, and I think that is the issue is that as long as people are seeing this as a financial issue, then all that you want very appropriately, all that you want when you don't have the money to feed your family is enough money to feed your family. I mean, that's just yeah. appropriate. Yeah. Um, but it isn't but it isn't actually the money that people want it's the ability to support their family that people want um and you know there there are ways of doing that in in other contexts i mean obviously like it could be growing your food it could be having a relationship with people who grow your food it could be basing things much more in the informal economy than the monetary economy um it could be time banking it could be uh, local currencies it could be any number of alternatives that there are but um but yeah, what I what I see, unfortunately, at the moment is a culture that's very wedded to that story. And so hardship is just going to continue um, spreading and intensifying. Um, I think the government is going to continue finding it harder and harder to um, effectively subsidize all the people's needs. There does come a point where centralized authorities, I mean, you know, the current UK government has a very strong ideology against, um, you know, social welfare, and that's that's a separate story. 
Um, but nonetheless, there does come a point as a society comes under the pressures of um, the destabilization of the climate and um, the depletion of energy resources and the pollution and the drawdown of every kind of resource, you know, the water table, the depletion of populations of all the species that we eat, et cetera, et cetera, all the myriad of interlocking crises that we face. Obviously, there comes a point where that centralized authority might not just be unwilling to support people, but actually unable to do so because money is ultimately a call on something real. Um, and if that something real isn't there, then it ultimately doesn't matter how much money you print. Um, as, as the Native Americans told us centuries ago, you can't eat the stuff. Um, so, um, so yeah, unfortunately, the path that we're currently on, um, I see as one of just increasing hardship um, with that desperation leading to greater environmental destruction um, as people, you know, grab hold of whatever they can. I mean, the idea of, I mean, you're seeing it in America at the moment, you've got on the one hand, Biden is saying, um, we're gonna ban Russian Im imports of oil and gas. Uh, on the other hand, the government is simultaneously boasting that they're producing more oil and gas than they ever have, you know, and that we ever did under Trump, which is of course what they particularly care about in their, in their weird political rivalries. Um, and so, you know, the idea there is not let's get away from this um, incredibly destructive energy system that we're on, but let's just, you know, reduce our dependence on a country that we're, yeah, currently seeing as the enemy. Um, and as I say, to, to bring in the, the optimism as well as the dark, you know, to me, the, the most important work we can do in that context is um, providing spaces where people can see needs being met in other ways. Um, so for example, here, um, you know, my, my great friend who I mentioned before, Mark Boyle, um, he, several years ago, um, well, I don't know, over 10 years ago, he was like, well, almost everyone I see who's doing something that they don't believe in, they're doing it for money. Um, and so he was getting quite anti-money and someone challenged him and said, well, if you hate money so much, why don't you give it up? And he said, all right. So he um, he decided to live without money for a year and write a book about it, um, which he did. It's called The Moneyless Man, and it's it's a fine read. It's a great um, and, uh, and then um, the irony is that the book became incredibly popular and sold really well, and, and he got a load of money from it. And then we were like, well, what, what, what do we do with this money? Um, and so what we did was basically buy this piece of land that I'm sitting on now um, and as we see it, buy it out of slavery, like buy it out of the market economy. Um, so we've got a place here we call the happy pig where people can come and stay for free and eat for free and, and you know, just exist without having to sell their labor, um, you know, in the economy somehow um, in order to have a place to be. Um, and without going on too much, like I would say like that for me is, is the fundamental challenge that we face. Um, you know, I was involved with Extinction Rebellion from, from the start. And um, back then I used to give a lot of talks to Extinction Rebellion groups about how, I think, you know, Extinction Rebellion is probably widely seen as a climate change protest and it, arguably it possibly is that now, but I used to give talks about how it's actually neither of those things really. I mean, it, it was never meant to be a protest. It was meant to be a rebellion. It was meant to be, we actually, refuse to participate in this society anymore because you've broken the social contract and are destroying our future and so we are beginning mass civil disobedience to refuse to be part of this ongoing extinction and it was never per se about climate change it was about extinction and a lot of people take that as meaning human extinction i don't limit myself to human extinction um to me it's about the absolutely unfolding extinction sixth mass extinction in the history of our planet that's happening right now um you know over 100 species a day going extinct now um and climate change is about third or fourth on the list of yeah. causes um you know habitat destruction pollution are far bigger causes of today's extinctions i mean climate change don't get me uh, you know i was a climate activist for many many years i mean climate change is absolutely huge and is gonna get worse and like 
the time we should have dealt with it was some time ago, in fact. But, um, but what's interesting about that is if climate change isn't the main driver now, but the extinction is already happening, then what is the cause? Um, and again, this brings us back to like why just switching to renewables isn't going to solve the issue. To my mind, the cause ultimately is our is our cultural stories about what's important and how we relate to each other and 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 to the more than human world. Um, and when I drill down into that, the story that I see most dominant in our culture now is financial independence. Um, you know, the idea that your first duty as a as a as a citizen as a consumer is to um support yourself financially otherwise you're you're a sponger or you're a parasite or you're a benefit scrounger or you know whatever right that's your first duty then if you've done that and you want to then go out and campaign about something or whatever fine you know then you've you've earned your right to have your own time that I think is so pernicious, so deep. Like it's such a deep story that you know, if you if you don't feel like you're financially independent, you know, you may be embarrassed to admit it to your family members or to your friends. You know, you maybe try and hide it by secretly taking out a loan or or, or whatever you do. Right? It's so deep in us that we don't even question it. Yeah, it's like a personal but, failure. Right. And yeah, I would argue because even the richest people Frozen. Did I, did I use you for a moment there? My back. Am I back? Yeah, you are. Yeah. You seem to be moving again. Yeah. So um yeah, I would argue that despite as you as you said, Kim, this being such a deeply embedded thing that we see it as a personal failure if we don't live up to it, financial independence doesn't even exist. Like even the richest people, billionaires. They're not independent. Like someone else still grows their food. Someone else still built their house. Someone else still does all the things that they need to be done. All that money allows you to do is be dependent on people you don't know instead of being dependent on people you do know, which is actually miserable. It's actually no fun at all because you'd have no meaningful relationships anymore. And like everyone you meet is just out or you're worried that they're just out for your money. Um, I, I read a book by an incredibly rich guy who was talking about nobody had touched him, physically touched him in, in, in years because you don't touch rich people. You know, you, you pull their chair out for them very carefully and, you know, you just, no, no, you haven't touched another human being in years. And this miserable state of existence is what we're all devoting almost all of our time to working towards before we can think about anything else. Otherwise, it's a personal failure. I mean, this is so mad. And so I would say that that is the fundamental level at which um, at which it makes sense to work for change, to, you know, to talk to people about, to think about, to, to build examples of, as, as we're trying to do here. And indeed, as John said in the, in the chat there about self-sufficiency, I think self-sufficiency is very often the, the green version of financial independence. It's the illusion of being able to meet all your needs yourself rather than being interdependent with others, which is always the reality. And yeah. again, not just with human beings, but with, with the whole natural world. So sorry, I've gone on quite a lot in response no, to your no, question, Kate, but there was a lot to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Who else? We've just got about 15 minutes left. Just come in if you've got a question. Can I, I haven't got a question. I've just, I just want to say that you have just really given me um, a lovely sort of shift, um, Sean, with this this idea that um, instead of feeling that the world is collapsing around you and taking things away from you, you can make your own decision not to want them anymore. I also don't fly. And the powerful feeling it gave me to be able to say, yes, I could, but I'm not going to anymore. Um, and I'm not going to eat, I don't know, Marmite, and I'm not going to, you know, just the, the self-empowerment of being able to say no before it's taken away from me, I think is, um, yeah, is, is big for me. Mm. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure, Thank you, yeah. Thank you, Jane. And I, I think as well, like, it's at least hypothetically possible that when something's involuntarily taken away from you, that you could retrospectively decide, ah, oh, maybe that was good for me. 
but I think that's an awful lot harder. Um, I mean, that's that's a skill that a lot of people are having to try and learn um, because they don't have the privilege that we have. Um, but I also think it's it's something I really challenge myself on at the moment is since I believe that times will continue to get harder for most of us. I have in myself both the impulse of, you know, well, I'd like myself and my close people to, you know, not have to go through the worst of that um, and the impulse to try and widen the circle of my compassion beyond that. Um, and I think often those are um, compatible, like often the things that we do to um, support our nearest and dearest are, are also to the benefit of the wider world, but not always. Um, and we all know plenty of examples of, of people, you know, looking after their own to the exclusion of others. Um, and I, I, I don't have a, a neat answer to that, but I do think it's, it's really important to acknowledge those impulses in ourselves um, and, and confront them where appropriate in ourselves, if only so that we can empathize with others. Um, because to me, the, the deepest challenge that we face today is, is a crisis in ways of relating. Mm -hmm. um, and there's such a drive in our cultures at the moment to polarization, to the idea that on any issue, what you do is you figure out who's on this side and who's on that side, whether it's, I don't know, climate deniers and believers or, um, you know, pro-vax and anti-vax or right and left or whatever it is. And to me, the fundamental issue here is, can we not talk to each other about things we disagree about? Like, has that ceased to be a thing that we, we do anymore? Like, I mean, like the COVID thing, I, I am perfectly capable of understanding both why during a lethal pandemic, people might want to get vaccinated. I'm also completely capable of understanding why people might have no trust in big pharma. I'm also completely capable of understanding why people might be worried about the medical effects of, of vaccination. I'm also completely capable of understanding why people might be worried about the civil liberties implications of shutting down society. I don't feel any need to take a side in this. I can sit and talk with people about these conflicting desires that we all share and how we're gonna balance those. That, that doesn't have to be a tribal thing. No, absolutely. So um, and, and um, just, Kim, Sorry, just, to, on, just on. to finish that thought. So, you know, when I recognize in myself this impulse to, you know, look after my own, I don't indulge that impulse, but I do use it to help me understand those who are like, let's keep out the refugees, for example. Like, and I don't want to turn them into another tribe either. I don't want to turn them into them. You know, I want to be like, okay, there's a person who shares this same impulse that I share. And I think the way that they're responding to that isn't actually to the benefit of us all. So, we can talk about that, but not see them as, as an enemy. Yeah, thank you, brilliant. Diane, I think you had a question and then we'll come to John. Um, yeah, I think it wasn't so much a question, it was more um, a follow on from what Jane said about flying. Um, I, I gave up flying a few years ago as well. Um, and the trouble is, it. You need money in order not to fly if you want to travel. I booked a holiday to Orkney about three years ago before the pandemic. It's been rolled over and finally I'm going to go in May. And I thought, well, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to fly at any point. So trains, boats, you know, et cetera, mainly trains and boats. But it's going to take me two days of traveling and costing me about 500 quid in actually traveling whereas if I went if I flew it would be half the price mm -hmm. or less than half the price so in order to my point is really that it, in order to not fly and still travel anywhere at all you have to have money which unless you're going to walk mm -hmm. you know what I mean so I think we've got to work some we also need to work on reducing the cost of, of uh, public transport, for instance, so that trains are actually cheaper than flying in order for most people to be able to do that. But at the moment, it's only people who are reasonably com comfortably off who are able to do that. 
Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, I mean, Diana. I think I think that's that's absolutely right. Um, you know, we clearly have a, an omnicidal economy that's driving everybody to destructive choices, and I think it's incredibly important work to try and challenge that. Um, you know, one of the large scale solutions, one of the large scale frameworks we need is a system that supports more healthy choices and not just healthy for ourselves, but for our wider environment. Equally, um, given that we are where we are and that that is the society that we live in, um, you know, we have a personal choice still that, well, given that that is the economy that I live in, do I choose to travel in those ways, you know? Um, you know, do I choose, like, is that, and again, I would emphasize like letting the part of you that does want to travel and the part of you that doesn't want the consequence of that to talk to each other and find a decision you make with your whole heart. And I don't say that assuming what the answer will be. Like, I, I would hate to think that someone took a jet flight and then didn't enjoy it because they were feeling guilty, like to, to destroy the world for the sake of something that you don't even let yourself enjoy seems even more mad to me than, than doing it and actually taking pleasure in it. Um, so really like choose a wholehearted path. And also as a final word on that, I would recommend Mark's, Mark Boyle's second book, uh, The Moneyless Manifesto, um, which talks about ways to reduce your moneyless dependence, your money dependence on money. Um, it talks about ways to travel for free, um, whether that be hitchhiking, whether that be couch surfing, whether that be um, staying with friends, whether that be a thing called house swap, where you know you and someone abroad each go and stay in each other's homes while you're away um like there are there are plenty of uh less monetary dependent ways of experiencing wonder and of course you know discovering things closer to ourselves there's a line in lean logic um talking about transport which is he quotes the unanswerable question at the heart of transport the one asked by the farm laborer standing bemused one day in the mid 18th century at the side of the Liverpool Manchester Turnpike, crowded with urgently speeded coaches. He asked himself, who would ever have thought that there were so many people in the wrong place? <laughs> oh, beautiful, thank you. John, you've had your hand up for a long time, go for it. Thank you. John, yeah. Great. Yes, and I'm taking down my hand, otherwise I'll forget. I just wanted to, to get in there before the end and thank Sean and yourself for the questions because it's so inspiring to, to, to come across someone thinking, thinking so radically about things in proper depth and, and, and the things that I'm perhaps only wondering about. And, and, and there you are having thought them through. So, so I've really enjoyed the session. I wanted to raise the idea of burnout, that actually to knock your head against a brick wall beyond the resources you've got is actually setting a very bad example <laughs> instead of finding things you can do and perhaps to sustain you in acting upon them to find some form of consolation or a viewpoint or something that gives you, gives you comfort. And that can be friends and family and uh, under, underestimated before, possibly, where you thought the purpose was to do the things that you raised at the beginning, Sean. Um, and, and consolations could consist of belief systems, could be a scientific dif discipline. In my case, it's the idea of deep ecology in which, well, a species come and go and here's an unsustainable one. Won't last long, but um, on, on, on we go. <laughs> through space uh, but that's that's not necessarily one i'd recommend to anybody else it's a bit detached from everyday things but it gives me consolation anyway i just wondered if you wanted to comment sean on consolations yeah sure maybe that's a good good one to end on kim um, yeah um yeah by all yeah. means by all means um so yeah burnout i've i've very much been there um seven or eight years ago, I, yeah, really drove myself into the ground. Um, mm. And, uh, and I think, well, I think first I'd, I'd agree with both sides of what you said, John, that there can be real consolation in, um, you know, taking a very big step back and, and looking at things. And I mean, ultimately, 
I mean, the universe, right? It either it either came from nothing and is going back to nothing, or it always is and always will be, and always has been. So either way, uh, how much can we mess it up, really? You know, like if if we if we end everything, maybe it'll just start from nothing again, or you know. So like in the very biggest picture, on the kind of you know cosmology or spiritual level yes i find some consolation there but i think that always has to be tempered as you say with the fact that it is quite detached and that it's all very well going ah well maybe humanity's going to die and it's totally different from you know your sister being suffering and being on the point of death and you'd do absolutely anything in the world to make her be okay and you can't because society's collapsing around you um, it's very different from the participant on our course right now, whose daughter-in-law is in Kiev. Um, you know, so I, I think we need. I think it's really important to hold both sides of this: the the danger in detachment, but also, yeah, the the sucker that it can bring. Um, but yeah, in terms of, um, you know, and again, you know, all the great atrocities in history have come through quite a detached point of view of, you know, oh well, you know, you've got to break a few eggs, haven't you? Um, but. Uh, but yeah, in terms of burnout, I mean, one of, and this kind of gets to the heart of dark optimism as well, like one of the um, things that always frustrates me a lot in environmental conversations is there's one argument that you hear over and over and over again, which is on the one hand, you'll have someone saying, we can't wait for paradigm change. We can't wait for anything radical. Everything's far too urgent. We have to operate within the frameworks we've got now. And I'm sure we've all heard that argument in so many different contexts and then on the other hand you'll have someone saying but what's the point if we don't have radical fundamental change we're just addressing the symptoms we're not addressing the fundamental problem like we absolutely need fundamental change and the funny thing about the argument is that i listen to both of those points of view and i agree with both of them and i very rarely hear anyone acknowledge that there's just this constant back and forth between these two perspectives fighting 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 and the really interesting question for me is what if we admitted that, yes, we need absolutely fundamental radical change and yes, there isn't time for that. Because that's where we are. So can we talk about where we are? And, and for me, when I went into a deep burnout, um, having bashed my head against that wall of impossibility for quite a while, um, I did. I went on this retreat with a group called Eco Dharma and um, one of the many incredible exercises we did there um, was sitting two of us opposite each other, two burned out activists opposite each other. Um, and one would just ask the question, um, if nothing I can do is ever enough, then what can I do? And then the other of us would say something about that in response to that. And then the first partner would just repeat the question, maybe with a slightly different emphasis, maybe not, just, okay, if nothing you can do is ever enough, then what can you do? And somehow our second answer to that was a little bit deeper. And we just repeated this to each other and, and went deeper and deeper into this question. And I found that incredibly powerful. And what I found in response to that question, well, you know, what if we need radical change and there isn't time for radical change? Firstly, I found deep grief. I found pain and tears and like having to accept that there are things in this world that if I could, as Robinson Jeff has put it, if I could burn my hand in a slow fire to change the future, then I would, but I can't. But then on the far side of grief, and I don't wanna, I don't know any way to honor how deep and painful and long that grief was in a conversation but on the far side of all of that I found that grief kind of takes all of you and it's non-negotiable and it's overwhelming but if you instead of denying it sit with it and go into it and let it break you there comes a day when it only takes 99% of you and you're kind of like, no, no, take all of me. But it doesn't. It's just as non-negotiable when it only takes 99% of you. And then you have to decide what to do with the 1% of you that isn't grieving. And in that space, for me, it was like, okay, actually, I, I believe I live in a dying world. And I don't believe I can change that. 
okay, here I am in a dying world. I'm still here. What am I going to do with my days? And then maybe I choose to try and preserve habitats to keep dying species alive a little longer, to create spaces of beauty and love, to bear witness to the truth in whatever ways they can, to challenge the injustices that I see. But then it's coming from such a different motivation. What, what my friend Michael Dowd calls the post doom motivation, because then there's no fear of burnout anymore, because then all I'm doing each day is telling the story I want to tell with my days. And I think burnout comes from the denial of like, oh God, I can't look at the latest data because it's just gonna make me lose all hope. And that's exhausting because you're denying something that you yourself know to be true. It's exhausting. But when we go beyond that to the place where like, okay, actually, yeah, all the data just confirms what I've accepted in myself. But nonetheless, this is who I wanna be in this context. That's not exhausting, that's beautiful. That's a joy to live each day in the way that you believe in, in the context of the truth as best you understand it. And yeah, that's stark optimism. That's, that's this post doom perspective. And that's why I think um, it's not only the antidote to burnout and it's certainly not the solution to all the problems of sustainability because ultimately sustainability is not a thing anything achieves all things end all things move towards their end even the universe all things move towards their end so sustainability is always an impossibility ultimately so let's not wed the meaning of our lives to sustainability let's not count the number of our days but the amount of life that we put into our days and you know all of us as individuals are going to die you know we're all moving towards our end um but we've got we've got time we've got hopefully years here together to do beautiful things with our time and that's all anyone's ever had um and yeah thank you all for being brave and honest enough to um be part of conversations like this about finding our way to that place wow well sean we've gone a few minutes over thank you so much it was extraordinary uh, i knew it would be but it, it's still wonderful that it was. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll post the, the recording <clears throat> on our various channels. And if we all want to unmute ourselves and say au revoir to Sean and, and but thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. Yeah, very profound, Sean. Privilege, Sean. Yeah, yeah real thank privilege. So real privilege. Thank you. Thank mm. you. I mean that 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 last um Thing I said uh, it was in some way paraphrasing a, a blog post I wrote um, about 10 years ago, which I put in the chat as well, if people are oh, interested. Wow. Um, sure. Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's, it's good to be walking this path with you all. And uh, Joy is a good guide as to whether we're on the right one. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thanks, Sean. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Kimberly. <laughs> See you soon. Bye. Bye. Yeah, thank Bye -bye. you. Bye -bye. Oh, Bye. Thanks, Kimberly, for letting me in, for giving me the Zoom. I don't know why. I'm always accessing these things. I don't know why. <laughs> Wonderful conversation. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you.